It was in Amsterdam 2000 when a miracle started that no one could have anticipated. Dr. Graham asked if I would bring together 600 strategists from throughout the world to take one segment of Amsterdam 2000. And we decided during that time that we would invite people to come to a room, 600, and meet around 75 tables, and we would talk about everything that had to do with the completion of the Great Commission and the fulfillment of the Great Commission. It was the third day when we were gathered together, and Paul Eshelman stood up, who at the time was leading the Jesus Film Project, but was starting to really study people groups in a whole new way. Stood up and talked about the least reached or the unengaged people groups at that time called untargeted people groups of the world. And there was about 230. Well, that's when Bruce Wilkinson came to the platform. He was working with Paul MC in the home meeting. He came up to the microphone and said, there shouldn't be any untargeted people groups in the world. Just the idea that there would be untargeted people groups means we're not doing our job. I said, we uh, lead the vast majority of the Earth's Christian army in this room. And if we decided together today, let's finish it. And there was a growing sense uh, in the room that uh, this is something that was uh, deeply on God's heart and that he had given the body of Christ everything that was needed to reach these people groups. And eventually I challenged the people and said, why don't you get around with a group from your organizations from all over the world and take a look at all those sheets of all the unreached people groups. And why don't you pick the ones you feel God is calling you and your organization and take ownership of this. And so he said, if you'll take one, two or five, come up and shake Paul's hand and say, we're taking two from our organization. One person said, well, I'll take one. And another person said, I'll take three. And another guy said, I'll take 10. He was a layman, he didn't know what he was talking about. But to his credit, I met him out in India doing it. And I just stood back and watched God tap people's hearts here, here, here. People came up, some of them were weeping, they embraced each other, and they put their name, and you could see things were happening in the heavenlies at that moment. The blood of Christ was being applied to, the, to these groups that have yet to hear he died for them. It was this electric environment. I mean, really, it was one of the most exciting moments that uh, we had experienced. And we got up to about 141 and nobody came. Nobody, they were all done. There was no one else coming forward. I invited the men and women to consider coming forward again and making commitments if they felt God was leading them. A few did and then it just stopped. I mean, it completely went quiet in the room. As as exciting was all the euphoria over adopting them, I mean, the opposite end was the discouragement we all felt at the quiet, because it just stopped. And I stood back from the pulpit and was praying quietly, saying to the Lord, Lord, every time I've ever watched you do something, you never did it halfway. You always completed it. Whatever you want, please complete it. And I was with Steve Douglas, who just become president of Campus Crusade for Christ. We were at the table together. He was our table moderator. And he knew I was with YWAM. And so he leans over and he goes, well, why don't our two organizations, YWAM and Campus, finish it? You know, take the rest of the list of the 232. And then all of a sudden, I saw a table out there, the table I was seated at, because it was the only table that had an empty chair on it. <laughs> it was buzzing back and forth and everybody else was kind of quiet, and these were key leaders in the country, and I thought that's unusual for them to be, talking like at this moment. My mind is spinning, I'm looking at the list on the table, because it, the ones that are left are the hardest of the groups. I mean, it's, these are the groups where you could go in, but maybe you wouldn't come out. And then all of a sudden, th there was consensus around this table. I was watching them, and, and they were nodding like this. And then somebody came up from table 71 with a note that said, Table 71 takes the rest. There was shouting in heaven, literally. I can't imagine what the angels must have sounded like when finally the sons of men stepped up to the bat in such a way that Christ's agenda, the what he's waiting to be completed, has finally become our most important finish line. And uh, I'm sitting back at the table thinking, oh my gosh, what did we just do? 
You know, we took responsibility for 120, 130 people groups. I think Steve was feeling some of the same. We rallied and, and actually started working overtime. We worked some during the breaks. We, uh, we actually met past the end of the time that our group was supposed to end. Steve and I look at each other and, okay, we committed to reach these groups. What's reach? You know, so we're trying to grapple with what are the key elements of what we call reach with these groups. And so we just named the obvious. We said, well, first of all, we need church planting. I was at a different table, and at the break time, David Garrison, who was the global strategist for the International Mission Board, and one on my staff came and said, you've got to come over to this table because something's happening. And he said, Avery, we need this, and we describe it, and he goes, I'm in. He pulls up a chair. Well, then we know we need Bibles, obviously, translated Bibles, and there were no Bibles in those languages yet for these groups. At the time, the president of Wycliffe was Roy Peterson. And during a break time, I was at a table adjacent to Table 71. Um, the group at Table 71 called me over and said, you've got to come over and listen to what we're thinking about. It just works like that until all of these main categories we call REACH all have their leaders sitting at the table. You know, every, every session we were just building one after another until we came to a time of, of developing a contract with one another, a commitment that we all signed by the end of the time. And we said, is this what we're committed to? And the answer was yes. We are committed to the number zero. That someday, people who do research would search to and fro throughout the earth, and they would find zero unengaged, unreached people groups. Good morning from Southern California here in the United States. It's a beautiful day here. I hope you're doing well wherever you are in the world this morning. I've often said that if I could choose any time in human history to be alive, I would choose right now. More people are alive than ever before, and more people are coming to Christ than ever before. It is absolutely a time of reaping, and the fields are ripe for the harvest. As we begin this conference, I want us to realize again that we build on the faith of those who have gone before us. It's the faith of those first disciples of Jesus. It's the disciples in every generation who have pioneered the expansion of the church and have led us to the unengaged people and places. And we give our thanks again to the churches of Korea that have helped sponsor so many of us to attend this global conference. We began the morning with a video of what happened at the Amsterdam 2000 conference. God touched us in a remarkable way. He seemed to impress us in our hearts and minds that the commitments that we were making at that time were holy promises to the Lord. And I would have to say that over these 20 years, there have been many reasons to quit. But what was begun at Amsterdam 2000 around Table 71 has continued to this very day. I believe you're going to be extremely blessed by what you hear during these sessions. The speakers are primarily practitioners. They've had years of experience, and some of them have been working in some of the toughest fields in the world. But they have seen God at work, and the global church continues to grow. Sometimes we get discouraged when we're at work and nothing seems to be happening. We may begin to believe that people aren't interested in, be, in knowing God. But in John chapter 4, Jesus tells us what to do. He says, lift up your eyes. The fields are ripe to harvest. And he's not just talking about a bush. He's talking about whole fields that are ripe to harvest. Right now, where you're sitting, put your chin down to your chest. And... As you do that, you'll realize you can't really even see the people next to you. But when you lift your head up and turn it to the right or the left, you can see the possibilities of what could happen. If you're sitting by a friend or a neighbor or a family member or even a stranger right now, just pray silently for them. Bless them. Ask God to use them and meet their every need. Your word of encouragement 
might be just what they need for today. And on a global level, there are wonderful things that are happening daily for the cause of the kingdom. One morning a few months ago, I received an email from a friend of mine who works with a ministry called Global Media Outreach. They've been using the internet to reach out to people with the gospel. On May 18th of this year, he called me to tell me that later in the day, they would likely pass a major milestone in their attempts to share the gospel on one of their 110 websites. Sure enough, that afternoon, their automatic counter passed the two billion mark. Two billion people who had watched one or more of their gospel presentations since 2004. Equally as thrilling was the count of those who had checked a box on their computer or smartphone indicating that they had prayed a prayer to ask Jesus to be their personal savior. 229 million people have checked that box on their computer or phone over the past 16 years. I asked them if more people have been uh, seeking God since the pandemic began. He said that their count of people reading the gospel has increased from 350,000 a day to more than one half million per day. He also said that when they ask those who have not yet made a decision to receive Christ, if they would like a free Bible to get more information, 3,000 people a day accept the gift and download in every day. I'm glad that we've shared the video this morning of the faith of those who sat around table 71 at the Amsterdam conference. Let me give you the report as it continues today. Table 71 has continued to meet three times a year for the last 20 years. When the table meets later this month, it will be meeting number 60. Several of those who were at the original table have already gone to heaven. Others have replaced themselves with younger leaders. But I want to give you the report of what has happened through these leaders as they remain faithful to the original contracts they signed with one another to finish the task. Before we get to the numbers, let me give you a few definitions. Finishing the task is a network of churches and mission organizations who are committed to the task of fulfilling the Great Commission. Its initial focus has been to recruit full-time workers to go to every people group in the world to make disciples, to do evangelism, and to plant churches. We decided to concentrate on those people groups that had no known followers of Christ no translated scripture, no churches, and no Christian workers. They were called unengaged or untargeted groups because nobody was trying to contact them or to engage them with the gospel. The task we talked about was making disciples and teaching them to observe all things Jesus commanded us to do. However, the task we began with was just beginning the ministry in every unengaged people group. Between the year 2000 and 2005, Table 71 did research. We found that there were many more than 200 or so unengaged people groups that were first reported. In fact, there were almost 3,500 groups with over 750 million people that no one was even trying to reach. That was the heartbreaking thing for me. Not that there were so many unreached people groups, but that no one was even trying. In 2005, Table 71 held its first conference at Billy Graham's conference center called The Cove. About 200 pastors and ministry leaders attended. We called the conference finishing the task, but it was only the first step. So in hindsight, we probably should have called it finishing the task of beginning. But let me tell you what has happened in these last 15 years. These are not the results of any one church or organization. No one group can take the credit. What has happened is a result of the work of the Holy Spirit and what he has done. FTT has grown to 1,660 organizations who've made a commitment to send workers to these groups 
within the next three years. As of April 15th, 2020, 3,126 different people groups have been engaged by 415 mission organizations and denominations. We only counted the group as engaged if the workers were, number one, living within the people group full-time, secondly, if they were ministering in the local or a trade language, thirdly, if they were doing evangelism, and finally, if they were planting churches for the long term. 415 of the 1,616 organizations were involved. Exactly 25% fulfilled their commitment. Together, they have sent out 29,368 workers, organized into 5,102 teams. It's about six people per team. These workers have planted 143,653 churches, and they're reporting 3.3 million new believers. One of the most exciting areas of response was in the country of Nepal. There were four different mission organizations that expressed interest in reaching more of the unengaged people groups in Nepal. When we mentioned the needs to a group of businessmen in the States, they asked us how much it might cost to engage the 57 remaining groups in that country. Within a few weeks, they called back to say that they would accept the responsibility for the finances. Within a few months, the four engaging organizations had recruited 121 workers and conducted the initial training in evangelism, discipleship, and prayer. Their first step was to do prayer walks through each of the people group locations and pray for God to lead them to a man or woman of peace. As they went into one of the villages, the villagers were about to make a human sacrifice. They had collected the wood for the, sacri for the fire to sacrifice a small boy. They believed it was needed in order to rid the cattle of their people group of a sickness. The worker that was there immediately shared the gospel and told them that Jesus had already paid the price. They said they would not kill the boy, but if by the third day the cattle were not well, then they would not only kill the little boy, but also the workers that went there. After three days, the sickness was gone from the cattle, and many of the villagers gave their lives to Jesus. Another of the people groups in Nepal are the Kasundas. They're the only people group in Nepal that still has their own king. One of the workers shared the gospel with the king, and he received Christ. He decided he wanted all of his people to hear the, the gospel, so he called them, all 225, to come together. By the end of the second year of the project, a number of the Kasundu had come to faith and they had started their first church. By the end of the third year of the project in Nepal, people had received Christ in all 57 of the people groups and 102,000 of them had heard the whole gospel story. So as we close, let's talk a little bit about what finishing the task really is and where it's going. First of all, it's a network representing many denominations and organizations. Other networks like 2414, Ethne, the International Reality Network, Global Alliance for Church Multiplication, are all training workers for the harvest. I just heard a report that GACX is reporting that almost three million new churches have been planted since 2010. And the seed company and Wycliffe are saying that they're on track to start the translation of the Bible in every remaining language by 2025. One of the staggering things is to realize that the person is alive somewhere in the world right now who will begin the final translation of the scriptures into the last language, and it's happening in our generation. But there's still a great global challenge that remains. The current statistics show that there are still hundreds of unengaged, unreached people groups worldwide. You have a list of the ethno-linguistic groups worldwide that are still unengaged. In addition, there are 370 deaf language groups. By the way, the seed company has hired several experts in artificial intelligence 
who've been making breakthroughs in researching how 70 million people who have been born deaf can be reached. I saw a 22 second video of a woman signing a deaf language. Beside her was a video camera that was taping her movements. On a table beside her, a keyboard was typing out what she was signing with her hands. And as she signed, it was typing out for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. These new developments are really exciting because we're, we're watching the hand of God at work in every part of the world. Finally, today I want to review with you the five factors that we believe are essential for our network to continue making a collective impact on the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Scholars say that these five conditions must exist if different organizations are to make an effective impact together. First of all, they need a common agenda. Our agenda at FTT is based upon what the scriptures tell us to do as it relates to the Great Commission. Secondly, we need a shared measurement system. There are many ways to measure the progress or lack of it in relationship to the fulfillment of the Great Commission. We have measured primarily whether the global church has been going into all the world. If not, where and to which groups must it still go? Thirdly, we need mutually reinforcing activities. FTT believes everyone has something to contribute. We've tried to help each organization go to those areas where it can be most effective, using its gifts and resources to make the greatest impact. Hundreds of partnerships have been established between those who have potential workers and those who have resources to help and support those workers. Continuous communication is fourth. FTT has tried to maintain this with an annual conference where we could share best practices and latest lists of groups and places where workers are still needed. This has helped to eliminate duplication and highlight continuing needs. Finally, number five is a backbone support organization. Crew has supplied the backbone organization, which I've had the privilege and joy of leading. This last year after the death of my wife, Kathy, and the clear leading of the Lord, I felt the need to step aside. Pastor Rick Warren and Saddleback Church agreed to assume the leadership and backbone support of the Finishing the Task Network. This network was born supernaturally, and I look forward to supporting the ideas and people that will be drawn to the movement because of Pastor Rick's leadership. Stand with me, if you will, while we conclude this session in prayer. Lord, we praise you and worship you and thank you for all you have done as a result of the Finishing the Task movement. We thank you for the thousands of groups where your church has been planted and it's growing and spreading. Cleanse us, Lord, from any sin in our lives that would hinder our service for you. And we pray all this in the wonderful, miraculous, and forgiving name of Jesus. Amen.